Hey there, this is Dan, the producer for Mark and Carrie. If you like this show, we highly recommend you check out Watson's other podcast, Trending Globally. You'll hear more in-depth conversations about politics and policy from some of the world's leading experts, including, occasionally, Mark and Carrie. You can find us by subscribing to Trending Globally on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Again, that's Trending Globally. All right, on with the show. Thanks. Hello and welcome to Mark and Carrie. Hello, Blythe. We're in our in our COVID locations uh, since we're on Zoom. Yeah, exactly. Even though there's no COVID now, right? or maybe there is, I'm not sure. But we're pretending it's not there, and it seems to be working. Yes, actually, so that's great. Kim Jong Un declared it it was over in North Korea, so therefore it must be over. So therefore, yes. it's over. Excellent. So you're in DC. What's it like in the swamp? You know, actually, it's quite pleasant right now. Low humidity. It's like it's like 88 degrees, which feels like heaven. So it's actually pleasant to be outside at the moment. Fantastic. It was actually cold here yesterday, but now it's back up to like, I think, 91 or something like that. Anyway, so much for the summer weather. What's been going on? Well, I mean, the news has just really perked up a lot of the, you know, Democrats, which, you know, are naysayers about everything over the last since we last spoke. Biden administration got a lot of stuff passed or not the big thing passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which we talked about last time, but also some some stuff that was big jobs numbers like 600,000 jobs added from the July jobs report. Inflation has come down a few like a half half a percentage point or something like that. And it looks like gas is down by like a dollar in some places. So these are all good signals, which, of course, have Democrats like thinking home run, maybe we won't lose the House by, you know, there'll be a, you know, won't be as terrible as one thought just a few weeks ago. The Senate maybe will be more competitive in the midterms, um, maybe plus or minus one or two seats for, you know, might not be, uh, again, um, a thrashing as predicted. But, uh, you know, I mean, this is all sounds really good in August. And then, you know, as we get deeper (laughs) into September, it looks a little bit worse, probably. I'll believe it when I can pull the Bloomberg data for the Michigan Confidence Index yeah. and then divide it by partisanship. Yes. Because I believe that Democrats are feeling a lot better the economy, but nothing's going to shift self-indebtified Republicans because that's just the way that we've become. And I, right? The yes. actual data doesn't matter. Agree. And also thinking about the gas, I mean, you'll appreciate this as an economist and me as like a you know wannabe economist. Isn't it a supply and demand issue that it was really high and there's less demand so the price goes down? Or is that too basic? You you mean that markets might actually work? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this goes back to a long running discussion we've been having about how we should think about inflation, right? There's a new Chicago Fed paper that's out, which uh, basically says if you compare, you know, Europe and the the United States, Europe is entirely food and fuel, Mm -hmm. right? Really bad hot summer, crop failures, effects of Ukraine on basic cereals, gas shortage cause of Russia, oil price spike. Uh, That's a low, like um, very, very hot weather leads to two warm rivers in France, so they can't cool the nuclear power plants. So they need to shut them down so there's less electricity, so the price goes up. That's the European story, right? And the American story, the, the, the one thing that stands out in driving inflation, this is brilliant. I used to say this is a joke, that inflation was caused by everyone being on Zoom and looking behind them all at once and saying, we need to replace that couch. It turns out it's true. The largest single driver of US inflation from 21 to 22 was consumer durables, which were in short supply because of COVID damaged supply chains. So, you know, this goes back to this whole thing of like, and why are we raising interest rates? What does interest rates have to do with any of this? This isn't a wage price spiral. Real wages are down again. But at the same time, right, really weird, as you pointed out, that really big jobs number. So we're raising interest rates to induce a recession and you get the largest monthly jobs gain in like, you know, in in whatever, over a year at least. Um, So, you know, it's a very, very weird and mixed period. 
from the just, you know, going out there, uh, traveling, etc. It feels like instead of buying the sofa or the thing that we needed to replace, that we've moved back to service stuff, that we've moved back to buying whatever, like, you know, getting your nails done and haircuts and like that sort of stuff, which yeah. could drive the, dro- the job numbers. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And, you know, something else I was thinking about with the co-author is we consume something now that we didn't even know existed in the 70s called digital goods. And digital goods basically, you know, are, are zero marginal cost by and large, right? I mean, somebody has to put up the website, but ultimately, once you have a streaming service, you just put it up there, you pay a fee, and the fee's pretty nominal in comparison to what the alternative of going to the movies every night would be, right? So these things are actually deflators rather than inflators, but like we don't even put them into the index. So, you know, how should we think about this continues to be an interesting question. Does the UK's Fed, Federal Reserve, whatever the, the name for that is, do they the bank, the of, bank of do they have the ability to to increase interest rates similar to what the Fed does? Oh yeah, and they're not. Yeah, they absolutely. are are not doing that. Well, they are. They're not being quite as aggressive. You know, no one really is because they're kind of hedging it in case they overshoot and basically kill the economy when they don't need to. Uh, and it's this whole debate between the inflation hawks who think that we're all on the brink of being the Weimar Republic in you know Germany in the twenties, versus the people like you know who are basically saying you know it's transitory. And what they mean by that is not just like, oh, it'll be gone next week. But, you know, these are sort of supply side factors that will resolve themselves one way or another. And if they don't resolve themselves, that's the source of your inflation. So why are you thinking this is driven by demand and therefore would, you know, work on interest rates, etc. So one of the things I think is really funny about this moment, like a couple of things. Number one, I did not see Joe Manchin turning. I didn't see that at all. I was absolutely convinced that was never going to happen. And, you know, partly part of the reason for this is some very serious people from sort of, you know, Bill Gates onwards just phoned him up and shouted at him <laughs> and just said, "You no, don't do this. This is crazy, right? You know, so there was a lot of lobbying, high-end lobbying that went into it. And then also just the, the, the brilliant fact that they've called essentially a slim down build back better, the Inflation Reduction Act. It has nothing to do with reducing inflation. It's just absolutely absurd. Couple of bits in it I thought were pretty interesting. The one percent tax on stock buybacks. One percent is nothing, right? Last year I think eight hundred and seventeen billion, so you're gonna get eight billion. That's not even a rounding error for the for the federal government. But it's a bit like when they introduced income tax in nineteen thirteen. It started off at about 1% or 2%. Look where it is now. So that's the thing. Once you've got that in there, you can start to jack it up. Hmm. Um, another one that's interesting is the claim that it's going to make 60,000 green manufacturing jobs. I have no idea <laughs> how you cook up that number. Uh, and then the one that uh, Kristen Cinema got in this one, which was she got half a million dollars from private mm-hmm. equity for her electoral purposes. And she made sure that the private equity firms still get to do this carried interest deduction so that their net income tax is way lower than yours and I. So it's good to see that in the midst of it all, you can get surprises, but there are some constants. Oh, I like the point about the 1%, though, that now there's in there, then you can, you can in- since it's there... You can raise it versus absolutely. Right. Oh, that's really interesting. Absolutely. I mean, this is why the Republicans fought so hard over Obamacare. You'll remember this, right? Because they know that once you get this established and people rely on it and they like it, you can't kill it. And Trump tried to kill it and simply couldn't do it. It's the same sort of principle. No, you're so right. It's so hard to take something away once it's established. I thought it was a great framing in terms of, I mean, you know, everyone made so much fun of Build Back that it was like, a, you know, uh, sounded like a convenience store or something like that or a furniture store. And that this was something that Manchin could sell, that it was to his constituents, that it was going to reduce yes. inflation because it said so in the uh, in the header. It said so in the yeah. headline, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I, this kind of uh, intersects with um, primary results, but I, I was just thinking too with Biden's, you know, the last month or, you know, few weeks that Biden's had some, some good news is that whether or not this can then mobile, I mean, mobilize and incentivize Democrats to actually turn out for the midterms. And you feel like, I mean, it's a lot of good news, but as you just said, you know, Democrats are like excited about it, but does it actually move them? It doesn't move the people that need to be moved in over the next three months, which basically could be like three years just in terms of the way that time works. And so 
in light of that, this is a long way for me to get to the primary results and thinking about, you know, the mainstream media has so breathlessly reported on Liz Cheney losing and is she like the savior of like, I don't know what party people think that she's the savior of, but this is, and I mean, tons of people have said this, but it's just a point that bears worth repeating. She's a Republican Democrat. She voted with Trump 93% of the time. Her last name is Cheney. Her dad is Dick Cheney. These, she is not a moderate. She is a pretty hard Republican. And whether she runs as an independent or not, most Democrats, just in terms of ideology, don't line up with her. So if you're thinking she's going to save either the Republicans or the Democrats, probably more likely that she's going to save the Republicans. But it's unclear that she could even do uh, she can do that. So there's some interesting stuff on this that went on in the midterms, because it was also the case that the Democrats were funding extreme Trumpers. Yes. So that they could beat moderate yep. people because they thought they were more of a challenge. This really worries me, not just because, in a sense, it's really undermining democracy. It really is an example of dark money coming from parties themselves. It's not good behavior. It also, it's very Democrat because it just implies that they think they're way smarter than they actually are, that you can really control the probabilities this way. Because congratulations, you got rid of someone that you might have been able to do a deal with in Congress on the belief that, well, they'll never vote for this guy. He's a complete mental case. Well, what if they do? Because then you've just added fuel to the fire. And it's very similar with the Cheney one. I mean, exactly this idea that, okay, let's say that she manages to run for president, she splits the Republicans. The idea is you benefit from that. But what if she basically splits the Republicans, but then still wins? Congratulations. You know, why would you do that? So Peter Meyer from Western Michigan, 3rd Congressional District, which which is right next to my home congressional district in Michigan, um, comes from a very Western Michigan famous family. Meyer is a big grocery store. It's kind of like the target of Western Michigan. And the question is whether you call it Meyer, Meyers, like, am I going to Meyers or Meyer? So anyway, this is Peter Meyer. Like, <laughs> he's a Republican. He wins. You know, I mean, this is a red district. It hasn't had a Democratic House member since 1993. It has voted for Republican president since 1992, I think. Since 1992. It is a red district. And so to your point, the Democratic Congressional Committee went in there and put like $100,000 worth of ads against Peter Meyer. And so um, so the more extreme Republican candidate has won in hopes that they, they think they're going to pick off this district in Western Michigan, which is the only district. Right. But as you say, exactly. It's a totally yes. red district. Why would you do this? This is massively yes. overthinking it. Yes. And, then, and there's just yeah. zero chance. So, I mean, it's exactly to your point. And I just you really shake your head as to why the Democrats would do this. But in any case. Well, to, to quote that old line is because they never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. <laughs> yes, yes, that is true. It's shaking my head the whole time on that one. So, so let's let's dive into the sort of the big story that was the huge story that became the non-story, yeah. which has disappeared as a story. Trump. Yes. Like you know, basically sending the feds down to Mar-a-Lago, coming out with boxes that are named President of France and other such suspicious things. What's going on? What's your read on this whole thing? Explain to me what's going on, because that's the type of thing I know is going on, and I just refuse to even follow it. Well, and there's so many different parts. I mean, it really is this labyrinth of the, of storylines to follow. So the, the FBI and a warrant okayed by the Department of Justice and Merrick Garland gets to go to Mar-a-Lago um, and retrieve the documents that they have been in negotiations for about a year to get. And so according to Trump lawyers, they signed a piece of paper that said, we've given you back everything that you've asked for. Clearly they had not. And so they got the warrant to go uh, to go down there. There wasn't any like helicopter OJ sort of footage of the FBI going in there. But I guess there's one Florida reporter that reported that the FBI was doing this before Trump announced that this was happening. And, you know, they um, they uh, invaded his beautiful home and his beautiful safe and like all that sort of stuff. But the they took a bunch of boxes under the Presidential Records Administration or Act. Some of the stuff is like totally mundane stuff, like a raincoat. And then other stuff is all this like top secret stuff. And of course, that's the stuff that's most interesting. But no one knows what that top secret stuff is. And so rumors are that it's like nuclear stuff. Is he selling the nuclear stuff to the North Koreans or Russia or, you know, who else, you know, wants it? 
it. He's, I guess, a file on Macron. Is he blackmailing Macron? No one knows. Like, what does he have on or does it? So mostly it's, uh, it's a lot of theories without a lot of evidence other than there was enough for a judge to sign to go in and take a bunch of boxes. So let's imagine that I'm not Mr. T, okay. right? I am me. Yeah. And I am not the president, but I worked in the federal government. And I took a bunch of boxes home and I wasn't meant to take them home. And then I said, oh, no, I've given them back. And then it turns out I haven't. And I got a knock at the door and say, we're taking this stuff. And you go, okay then, right? You wouldn't be that surprised then if I ended up getting put on the naughty step and possibly even getting some jail time if I was a normal person, right? But this is the president. So there is this idea that it has to be something like this. It has to be like, you know, he's buddy-buddy and is still being communicating with, like, Mr. Kim in North Korea, which in and of itself is totally mental. Uh, and therefore, you know, is he telling him something that he shouldn't? It's based on these secret documents, right? Well, the fact that he has the documents, you know, you then have to join the dots from there to somewhere else. And I worry, or rather I just think this is probably true, that this is just another example of the Mueller investigation. Yeah whereby they've already arrived at a conclusion. And what you need to do is just dig until you find enough paper and then you'll find the evidence and it's true. And it's like, no, you've tried this before, right? Just because he has this stuff doesn't mean that there's anything nefarious. And if all you end up doing is putting him on the type of like third degree felony that you'd put someone like me on, then this is just going to play right into yeah. his narrative that from the moment I showed up, you have persecuted me. Yep with every legal avenue you can, and it totally sets him up for coming back as president. Again, they're overthinking it and taking a hell of a risk. Is that a reasonable interpretation? It is, and you know, the New York Times reporter that has reported on Trump since his days in New York, uh, Maggie Haberman, said that there were uh, you know, like three or four days in which no one said it, in which Donald Trump completely said it, right? All, basically, what you just said, which is that this is, you know, the amount of, you know, weaponized of the FBI and blah, 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 and filled that vacuum with all of this information. And the DOJ just kind of sat back. And then when Merrick Garland finally did say something, so there's this, you know, this game of chess that I don't know that anyone really pays any attention to except for, you know, hardcore political nerds. But there is this point, I think you're right, that it becomes just the Mueller investigation. The thing that I think is more is more interesting on a, one, another one of these storylines is that Alan Weisselberg, I don't know if he's like a lawyer for Trump or if he was a ta the account bookkeeper. I don't know what his official title was, but he just pled guilty for essentially keeping double books for the Trump organization. And that's what I that is more interesting to me, because I think, you know, you get caught not on taking home the nuclear codes and selling them to somebody, but you get caught on on bookkeeping or something yeah. like that. It's the uh, it's the Al Capone way. You don't get them for the murders. You get them for tax yeah. evasion. Yeah. So I I mean, the, and he I guess you know has refused part of his deal has refused to turn on Trump. But I mean, there's something there's something more there, much less exciting. Right. But but again, but there is this thing as well. I mean, I just did a, an, an online MBA class on sort of tax avoidance, and you know, one of the most common form of tax avoidance you get, and it isn't just big multinational corporations who do this. It's local restaurants. <laughs> and they used to have two sets of books, but now they have electronic point of sale. Uh -huh. And those EPOS machines can be fitted with software that basically deletes randomly every, every third sale. So you can basically have what you really did. You can download that and then you can actually submit the completely doctored books. So again, it's one of these things. I'm not saying that this is right, yeah. but it's like, well, hang on a minute. You know, if this was anybody else, would you be going after him for two sets of books after he's out of office? Again, there is a political mo motive behind this. There, you know, and it's very hard to say, oh, no, we're just following the evidence. It's like, no, you have a conclusion and you're trying to find the evidence. This is what it is. Now, on the other hand, you could say, well, you know, the guy has basically said that I am a giant threat to democracy. Um, I'm going to tell this continued untruth about the election. And when I get back in, I've already told you it's the revenge and wrecking tour. So really bad shit could happen. So this is, in a sense, preemptive defense. Okay, but then we're in a whole new ball game politically in terms of where we are with like, you know, the United States being a democracy and who the forces are that play that game. Yeah, and it, I mean that's the thing, Blythe, is that it just reads to anybody who's just very casually reading the headline of like just a, exactly what you just said. That it's just you've reached the conclusion and this is where and, and you're gonna get to that conclusion. And that is there's no real sense of somebody has done something wrong. Because I don't 
as much as Americans or the majority of Americans or whatever the, the latest poll says about President Trump, I don't think there's a lot of appetite to see a former president indicted or thrown in jail. I just, I just don't think that that's sort of where... Well, and also, you know how this works, right? The minute one side does it, the other side That's does it next thing. time, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, so you just end up sort of, you know, escalating the whole time. Right. Well, as Hunter Biden's laptop is the right and like indictment of him and like all that stuff. So, yeah. Is that actually still a thing? I remember it was a thing, then it stopped being a thing, then it came back slightly to be a thing. Is it still a thing? Well, I've been listening to a lot of uh, podcasts because I've because it's been so nice outside. So I've had a lot of walking time. And uh, time, so I've been listening to podcasts I don't normally listen to, and that seems to be a big talking point about Hunter Biden's laptop. It tells me a lot about you that you listen to podcasts that are going on and on <laughs> about Biden's Hunter, laptop. Hunter, Hunter Biden's laptop. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Carrie and Hunter Biden's yeah. laptop. What the public don't yeah, know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So listen, speaking of other people who are kind of wrecking balls in their own right, Nancy Pelosi. I mean, I just know her as Mrs. Payfor, yeah. but it turns out she's actually a foreign policy hawk as well. She went over to Taiwan and basically China got very angry. And then a whole bunch of people followed her on the kind of like We Love Nancy trip and went there as well. It seems that some of the Taiwanese are actually kind of uncomfortable about this going, thanks, but do you have to keep doing this and pissing off our neighbors? Yes. Again, Kari, I ask you, what is this all about? Why do this? <laughs> well, I, you know, I wish I had some deep, uh, deep insight. The one piece of insight that I have on this is that this is somehow the only bipartisan, the only thing that both parties seem to agree on, and that is that we want to stand up for Taiwan, or maybe not even stand up for Taiwan, but we just want to stir the pot with China. And that the this I was surprised that there was another congressional delegation going uh, going over there. And I think there's one more planned after this as well. So it is certainly not you know that the Biden administration is trying to keep people at home. And I I think you know anti China rhetoric is probably good for business as uh, as well, especially headed into the midterms. What's your take on this? Oh, well, I mean it, it's very similar. I mean there's a whole bunch of uh, bipartisan cooperation that's going on just now. The United States is. Uh, signing these agreements with countries like Panama, uh, basically giving them more than preferential trade treaty, uh, tr trade access, etc. And the point of this is to kind of deglobalize from China, like to get your supply chains out of there. The whole Chips Act about building giant chip factories here, because if Taiwan ever gets invaded, then eighty percent of your advanced yep. chips is gone, and China control it. Right? This is all big time geopolitics. I get this, but I don't get sort of you know let's say, ego trips for politicians and photo ops for politicians are at a time when this is very sensitive in the sense that you want to be able to, you know, build your own supply chains, build your own chips, deglobalize, be less, you know, vulnerable to China. You're not going to do that by basically rocking up every week with a new congressional delegation and giving them the finger from the cliffs facing China. Why are you doing this? This is seems to be strangely counterproductive. Unless, of course, what it is, is less provocation and more signaling, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is to say, we don't think you've got the capacity to do this just now. So what we're going to do is we're just going to come over and basically make you do more and more exercises and spend more and more, you know, munitions and all the rest of it doing your thing. We'll watch you the whole time because every time you do one of these war games, it tells us what you're going to do. And, you know, we don't think you're really going to go for it. So we're going to annoy you and we're going to observe you and we'll see how it goes. So there may be a kind of strategic purpose to this, but maybe I'm being far too clever and overthinking it, Well, which has to be the title for this episode. Yeah, no, I think that's right on. Yeah, I like that point because it because it seems much more subtle than just hitting them over the head with a hammer and hitting China over the And it seems like maybe there's some strategy behind it besides, to your point, the just going because... I'm, I need some miles. Yeah. I mean, the really the, the disturbing thing about this is the one area where the uh, administration in China were still cooperating was in climate. Yeah. Because, you know, China is the world's largest emitter. They have every incentive themselves to clean this up. But cooperation on this basically helps both sides. And they have said, you know, if you keep doing this, we're just killing all cooperation. You don't want to go there. Similarly, the way that the Ukraine crisis has been working out, it's not working out well for Russia. Their domestic economy is in terrible shape and it's getting worse, is that they've basically signaled to the US that, like, you know, we really just consider you a combatant at this point in time. And the problem with being the United States is 
it's you know it's kind of a lesson from early World War Two. It's not the fact that you're not powerful enough to like push these folks around. It's the fact that you're driving them into an alliance with each yeah. other. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's the problem. And you're talking about an alliance that would encompass basically every piece of real estate from the Pacific coast all the way to the Baltics. Mm -hmm. Not so great. Right. Not so clever. Yeah. No. And I get you. You leave countries with no choice or very few choices. And so they all I mean, I mean, they're not going to just lay down. And so you force them. Yeah, that's a really good point. On the thinking about climate change. And the very hot summer that we've had in the United States, you feel I feel like all the headlines are just more heat, drought, flood, fill, fill in the blank of some extreme weather around the world. I mean, China's now, but I think they both have ma massive floods and massive drought in their country. I mean, we already mentioned what's happening in Germany. I mean, the Loire. Well, Kentucky has yes. floods at the same time that like Texas is like hotter yep. than Venus. Yes. And the main what's the main river in France is like now just like a trickle. Oh, it's in Germany the Rhine. Yes. But like French rivers are down by forty yeah. percent. And they're also so warm they're actually affecting like, you know, all of the pond life. So, you know, this is serious stuff. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. This is sort of, the, you know, the big stuff that's hard to get your head around. The one I've been following, I've been fascinated by, is the way that we talk about the Colorado River. So the way the media talks about this is Lake Mead, yeah. right? So it's Lake Mead is this big artificial lake. It's part of the New Deal. They've dug it out and built it and built this big reservoir. And then there's this idea that it becomes a dead pool. What does a dead pool mean? It means that the water falls low enough that you can't actually open up the generator sluices and run the water through to make electricity. So basically it lights out and then air conditioning out bad things happen right but the the bigger story behind this is the colorado river is drying up right this is part of a mega drought which has been going on for 1200 years all that climate change has done is went let's really accelerate this and make it really really bad right so whether it's like fundamental cause or just accelerated or whatever it is less relevant the fact that like it's running out, right? Now, this week, I don't know what actually happened with this. The way that they did all the water rights back in the 1920s is pretty ludicrous with like LA gets more water rights and people who are upstream and all this nonsense, right? Which is why you end up with like California agriculture and overwatering and blah, blah, blah. And apparently everyone right through the whole sort of riparian basin area, the whole river area, has said, right, 20% cuts or perhaps even more to everybody, right? How do you do that? I mean, a 20% cut in water usage. Just think about that in your own house, right? I mean, that's a yes. Everything, yes. right? Yeah, that's actually huge, right? And how are you going to do that? Well, you're going to have to then apportion it because, like, households were going to want theirs. And you do want crops. And that whole area, particularly the Valley area of California, right, that's a huge part of America's breadbasket. Well, not their bread basket, more like their tomatoes and almond avocados basket. and almonds, almonds, <laughs> yeah, basket, right? But nonetheless, you know, it's a very important food growing area. And if these areas start to basically like dry up and overheat, and there was another study that came out this week. I forget the people who did it. It was some New York think tank agency. I don't know if you saw this. And they basically did heat and flood predictions for every zip code in the US. And what they did was they took the climate models. If I remember this right, they took the climate models that basically do the global stuff and localized it and used as much micro data as they can and basically said, so what's it going to be like in Rhode Island in 20 years time? And it turns out it's going to be hot as hell with a moderate flood risk. But if you look at places like Florida, it's like gone, just yeah. gone. Every, there's, <laughs> yeah, it's over, right? Now, you know, Florida, again, one of the wonderful things about Florida, two growing seasons, right? You grow all year round, you go down, the produce is amazing, right? Well, it won't be amazing if basically it dries up and it's constantly 110, 115 degrees, right? This is very serious stuff. And, you know, we're just beginning to sort of go, ooh, maybe we need to start thinking about this. I think that's the thing that confuses me and I and I don't really know what to do with is that we're just, we, the governments, are just trying, are just now starting to maybe do a little bit and it feels like it's too late. And then, uh, you know, and I've said this before, but then as an individual, you're encouraged to, you know, turn off your water tap when you're using your toothbrush and you're just like, but I don't really think that makes a huge difference, but okay, I'll do it anyway. And so you just, I don't know, I, I, my hope is somewhere, but I just don't know where to put it because it just feel, you know, when you see the Arctic is 
is warmer or what it's um, melting fat four yeah, times fast. Yeah, warming fat. four yes. times as fast. Yeah, yeah and exactly. like there's no glaciers left in Norway. I mean, that seems like maybe we're a little bit like... Yeah, it's a little bit scary yeah. time, isn't yeah. it? It definitely is. But, you know, I've always thought the analogy that we should use for this is not like, you know, humans don't really act well to distant threats. They need. To, I think the analogy is a smoker. Like, if you're a real smoker, you absolutely know the risks, and you tell yourself, and you swear blind that you're going to stop smoking, and you keep smoking. And some people do manage to quit, but a lot of people keep doing it. And then eventually, the only time they really do anything is when it's too late. That You know, that's what humans do. It's true. Right. You know, we're, we're, just, we're just like one giant collective smoker that refuses to read the box. Well, and we just predict that our future selves will stop smoking and like be really good about yeah, whatever, and exactly. then we get our present selves. Yeah, we, we, we do all this like discounting yes, on yes, now versus yes, the future, yep, and yeah, yep, yep, all yep, that yep, kind yep, of stuff. Yep. Exactly. Anyway, okay. let's talk about something happier, yes. if not happier, than at least more amusing. The Wagatha Christie trial came to a conclusion. Did you catch this? I did, and I caught it because we had talked about it. I was like, oh, this was something that we didn't know at the time, so I wanted to wrap up exactly. on that. Exactly. Yes. So let's go back to the Wags. Yes. yes. So. How did it turn out, Carrie? Well, so Rebecca Vordy lost the libel trial to Colleen Rooney, as you had uh, uh, had educated me on, uh, two wives of mega super soccer stars. And um, the verdict was that Rebecca Vardy knew and condoned details that were being leaked about Colleen Rooney to the Sun. So in other words... She, it all goes back to those Instagram posts where basically uh, Colleen really said, I've basically deleted all of these people from my private channel. The only one left is this one. This is the one who did it. And eventually the judge went, yeah, that was probably right. So, you know, that's, uh, that's the whole thing. So now they're uh, basically Vardy is left with the legal costs of doing this, which are several million pounds. I know you get paid a lot as a premier footballer, but, oh, that's going to hurt. That's definitely going to hurt. And also sort of reputation-wise, you don't go back on Strictly Come Dancing once basically, you know, you, you've been publicly shamed. It's going to be interesting to see how this one plays out. Have you seen any movies? Have you anything going on? Well, when it was really hot, I broke down. Um, I don't have air conditioning, and so I just, I broke down and went to the movie um, and saw Bullet Train. This is the Brad Pitt one when they're on one of the bullet trains in Japan. I have to say it was quite entertaining. He plays oh, okay. this, you know, kind of funny, like hippie kind of, but it was actually very entertaining. It had a plot that I could follow. So, I mean, it was like straightforward, but some good action, some funny dialogue. I, I was all in. Excellent. Sounds great. Uh, I have not been to the movies, and we do have air conditioning. So, uh, <laughs> but it, we we ran out of something, and I started watching an Apple Plus series. It's got Gary Oldman in it called oh, yeah. Slow Horses, which is a kind of John le Carre thing about basically spies who are not very good and get booted out of the effective service into this kind of retirement home for spies. It's it's also very good, highly recommended. And you told me before we started doing this recording that finally this fall. It's coming. What's coming, yes. Carrie? Harry's tell-all memoir, which was supposedly written at the height of his anger towards his brother and his father. So mm. we are about to get, you know, the full blast of, well, potentially the full blast of, you know, what was on his mind and his anger towards the House of Windsor. So, yeah, exactly. So I don't know when it's being released. I, it's October, or I've confused that, or it hasn't been announced. But certainly this is going to add to their pile of pile of money that, that they have. But what, wasn't he meant to be coming back into the fold? I mean, he went over for the Queen's Jubilee and all this sort of stuff. Repa he seemed to have been repairing his relationship with his brother. I mean, they must know that this is coming if that's the case. Yeah, and I think that's part of the, I mean, and part of the tension is that this is, you know, where is he? When he wrote that, he was super angry. And now if right. he's on the reconciliation tour, is this going to then cause uh, further, da further you damage? you any idea how much he's getting? Oh, no, I didn't. I'm sure, you know, more than a couple million dollars, right? Yeah, exactly. That's interesting. Well, I can assure you that's definitely one book I'm not going to be reading. <laughs> like, I, I'm going to put that, I'm going to put that on the, I couldn't give a, 
yeah. pile. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, whatever, we'll see. Because oh, you don't actually need to read it. All you need to do is read all yes. the tabloid gossip about yeah. it when somebody else has read it for, I don't know, BuzzFeed or something like that. And then yes. you'll just get all the juicy bits out of that. Right, you can just read it while you're like having your coffee in the morning or eating Yeah, when your you're doom scrolling about the Colorado River growing up, then yes. you can basically yes. right flick and then get onto a story about the House of Windsor blowing yeah. up. So, you know, yep. there you go. That's right. That's right. Um, well, I hope you're having a good end of summer, end of August, although it sounds like you are busy as can be. Yes, I have been. I spent the past couple of days being uh, the, the centre of a minor media kerfuffle in Scotland, but I won't bore listeners with the details. I'll post something about it on Twitter next week. But uh, yeah, kind of interesting and weird and strangely time-consuming at the same time. Actually, but right now, my neighbour's got a pool, so I'm going to go for a swim. Oh, well, that sounds like a great conclusion to maybe a few, a couple of days that have been kind of stressful. I think that's great. I think it's exactly that. And the only choice facing me when I get out of that pool, is it spicy margarita time or is it dark and stormy time? Whoa. Well, well these, this, those are good choices to have. And they are very good choices to have. Have a good weekend. Great to see you. Thank you for listening. Bye, everyone.